souls of children of child. Two Sundays ago, two Sundays ago. And, uh, I, told you, I, had, I 
felt the change. I felt something shift in my life. And I d decided I would only teach serious listeners for the rest of my life. And that I only wanted to teach to people. When you're young, you'll teach to anyone who will listen. But when you get older, you want to only teach to people who believe. And there's a time to teach to the unbeliever. Many are, but I'm not called to them. I'm called to people who receive the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of wisdom. I'm going to walk you through this, and then you're welcome to take some notes, or I think we're, we're taping it. Is that correct? They are taping this. Do they have a duplicator here to make the CDs available? Our time together here now, forgive me for being late, but at least I'm here and I'm thankful that you're here waiting for me. The ministry is when we connect people to God. We're the connection. When we're awakening people a consciousness of the Creator, and we bring people from their problem to the healer, to the restorer. That's what ministry is about. Psalms, or excuse me, Isaiah 61, if you've got your Bible handy, and uh, I'm understanding that we're on streaming live, are we? Okay, good. So some, I'll know, I guess, when someone texts me or something from uh, Dallas, Texas, or Fort Worth, we hope they'll be able to follow us. I have not received many updates at all. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the, <clears throat> of the Lord God is upon me. What does that mean? That means I see what other people do not see. I hear what other people do not hear. The spirit-filled, spirit-led person is in a very different world than other people. Because the Holy Spirit is not only a person, but he's a place. Lynn, the Bible says in him we live, we move, and we have our being. The Holy Spirit is not only a person. The Holy Spirit is a place. We live in Him. We talk in Him. And there is a distinct separation from the Spirit life and those who don't live in the Spirit. In fact, when the Bible talks how can two walk together lest they be agreed, they cannot be agreed unless they're seeing the same thing, hearing the same words. Receiving the same consciousness of God's presence. It's almost impossible to bring some people out of where they are into a different world. But he is a different place. In him we live. I've been in Catherine Kuma meetings. Benny Hinn has preached all over the world. And I never am in any place where the Spirit of God is greater in His movement than in my bedroom, in my, my house, wherever I'm at. I live in Him. I move in Him. I speak in Him. And I don't get along well with people who don't walk in the Spirit. Because we're seeing two different things, hearing two different voices. You can live in Him. You can walk in Him. You can literally bring his presence in every room that you walk into. I'm very aware of the Holy Spirit, not only within me as a power, but he is my companion on my right side. I want to read this and then I'm going to give you some things what I feel like you should know in your ministry. Decisions you should make. And how ridiculous it is for us to be waiting for things to happen when we're the one that makes them happen. I wait on God, but I never wait for God. He 
You sleeping? You okay? You awake? Amen. All right. Well, did someone make sense that you better you better have some energy or I'll go sit somewhere where else? Oh, yeah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me. And those four words explain why I'm here today. It explains everything that I do. He hath sent me. The captives do not always call for you. The deliverer is sent. If you don't think you're sent by God, you have no business there. And if you're sent, you should happen at 100% everywhere and anywhere you are. I'll pray for people in planes and, and even I was in uh, Dubai. Dubai is not known to be a Christian. <coughs> Jerusalem, you know. Dubai is a beautiful place, but they are very strong against any Christianity, any voice, anything. But when I walked away from the counter, the lady at the airline uh, met me out in the hall in the, where everybody was, everybody's there. And she came running over to me and she says, I looked on the internet to see who you were. Will you pray for me right now? <laughs> And I said, of course. She said, there's something so different about you. I said, yes. He's the Holy Spirit. And uh, I put my arm around him, began to pray in tongues, pray in the Spirit. And while I was praying for I had pictures of myself riding tracks in the prisons in Dubai, you know. I hope I get through this. I hope I don't in that prison. But if they do, I'll just be the Apostle Paul Jr. <laughs> the difference. The Holy Spirit is the difference in us. There's a big difference between accepting Jesus as my sacrifice, receiving his love, but being advised by the Holy Spirit. Jesus trusted him so much he was willing to go through Calvary knowing the Holy Spirit would raise him from the dead on the third day. The first thing we want to do in this day is become conscious of the invisible Jesus who walks on our right side, the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart. We create change. Everything changes. I never, I'm always aware that when I walk in any place, I walk in a store, everything changes. Everything's possible. Because I am a link to God for so many people who have not met Him. So many people who have not experienced Him. To proclaim liberty to the captives. There's two classes of people on the earth. Some people think they're male and female. Some people think it's black and white. Some people think it's young and old. But the two classes of people on the earth are deliverers and captives. All deliverers know what it means to be set free. The captives, thank you, Pastor Ron. The captives were sent to people who were bound, accustomed to chains, people who don't have confidence, people who have no memories of victories, people who feel like somebody else created their life. That they've had nothing to do with their own life and their own decision making. I'm going to share some things today 
that may seem hard to receive, but I want you, you know, the other day I was talking, uh, in America, uh, Donald Trump is the number one leading person right now for the Republican Party, and he happens to love preachers. And uh, one of the most lovable men you'd ever be around in your life. Uh, I mean, enjoyable. He's, he's just the same. In, in, if you're sitting at a table, he's the same as if you were there. A very precious man. Now, they'll pull out his mistakes he made, and he does make them. And some people say, what do you think about men that make mistakes? I get real happy. If they can get that far making all their mistakes, surely we, have, we can get this as far as we need to get. <laughs> never, never become discouraged when you see somebody make big mistakes. Say, hallelujah, I got a chance to. Oh, yeah. I, I'm not comfortable around perfect men. I never have been. But uh, I say this, but he was introducing me a few weeks back to one of his friends, Governor Chris Christie. He was one of the people that was running for, for president. And we were, he was introducing me, talking about uh, my life and about the power of God that flowed through my life. And I began to think, and this is important, if you've never been set free you may not feel the pain of captives. But if you've ever felt lost, everything in your life is going weird. I want to share some things today that may be hard for you to accept. And I want you to really be open. And uh, I'm very logical. Very, very logical. And you'll understand it. But it's going to be important today for you to hear from your heart. And the Holy Spirit will confirm what truth is. One of the wonderful things I love about the Holy Spirit is when I hear someone speak, I know their limitations. I know what they've experienced. I also know what they haven't experienced. One of the best soul winners in America. I mean, he is a soul winner. Uh, he really is. One of the best, most articulate preachers of the gospel. Speaks Greek and Hebrew. And I was talking to him today. Did you know that he doesn't believe in divine healing? No. And he doesn't believe in tongues. But I really, really like him. He's a good man. A very good man. Runs 18,000 in his church. He's become the voice of many in Christianity. In fact, he was telling me the other day about how he quoted me in some of his books. But he's never experienced the prayer language. He's never experienced personal divine healing. And so if you haven't experienced something, you may be against it. You may not believe that. And I want you to listen today because most of life, you and I will never experience much of it. I doubt that we've experienced 1% 1 of 1,000% of life. And the part that we experience, we become strong about. But there's also so much we don't know. I hear people speak other languages. I just shake my head. I think that's so wonderful to be able to speak another language. I just feel like if you could speak two languages, well, shoot, you could build a skyscraper in 24 hours. <laughs> I marvel at people that can speak two languages. Just marvel. How do you do it? I can. If you are, the Bible says there's a trait called humility. And we think sometimes it's a personality. If a person's real quiet, they're real humble. Not necessarily. We think if somebody's loud, they're not humble. Humility is recognition of what you don't know. Recognition that 
that somebody else has something you don't have. Somebody else sees something you don't see. Now imagine a man who could speak Greek and Hebrew and English was my worst subject in school. So I barely do well in English. But a man who can speak Greek and Hebrew but doesn't know about the prayer language that unlocks so many things from God. So you can know the alphabet and not know a lot of words. You can sit in school 12 years and never speak but one language. I want you to enter this time today as a learner. And you watching wherever you're there, I hope you're there. I want you to see yourself as a learner. I've been praying the Spirit asking the Lord to help me teach people effectively. Because I teach so many people and I don't see them doing what I thought. And it just crushes me. It's like you. How many have children? How many wish they were smarter? How many is very concerned about the rebellion in your children? How many know that rebellion is going to bring them a lot of pain? Well, that's how we do feel in the ministry as spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers. We see so many people out of place where they could be with God. We know, you see, a man that's been on the road before knows where the problems are going to be on the highway. When you have heard God's voice, you know God's voice, you know what agitates God, you know what makes him angry, and he gets angry. The Bible said he's angry with sinners every day. <laughs> every day. I'm going to introduce you to some things that you must believe for you to make changes. The changes in life are not all up to God. If they were up to God, there would be no reason to learn anything. And I want you to become a learner. Learning creates new energy. Learning gives you the skills of others. Learning gives you access to knowledge time will not give you. Because time is never a teacher. Time is not a teacher. There's 90-year-old men that's never accepted Jesus. Still stupid at 90 years old. Isn't that amazing? There's thousands of people who's never even read the Bible. So we start off today recognizing that there's so much I don't know. Well, I love seeing all this decoration up here. I'm getting excited now. Happy birthday again. Happy birthday again. <laughs> there is so much you don't know. And that's the importance of regret. I heard an 80-year-old preacher say one time, he said, I have no regrets. He actually said this, Brother Henry. He said that he says, I would not make change a thing in my life if I had to live it over again. I thought, how stupid. He hasn't learned anything in 80 years. I have regrets every day. Regret is the fragrance of discovery. Regret is the proof you've learned something. If you go one day without a regret, admit there's nothing you've learned that can improve your life. Now, I'm not around very many learners. I love learning. I'm obsessed with learning. But the average person only wants to survive. They don't have big goals because they don't listen to the people who achieve those goals. I had a preacher one time said, I've always wanted to write a book. I said, all it is is just writing down what you've been saying. That's all it is. There's no miracle about writing a book. One hour book, 
one hour speaking. I was looking for my 31 days of wisdom book. Where's Pastor Ron? If he's in here. That's okay. If you can find it, tell him I'm needing that book. We'll give it to you later. But if you talk for one hour, that's a 32 page book. Every parent ought to be writing books for your children so that after you die, and you can use the book while you're living. But just go in there and say 10 things. Yes, the, the book, 31 Days of Wisdom. I thought we had enough for everyone. Yes, I want to teach something from that. But the Bible tells us 46 times to write. Write your vision. Make it plain. So he'll run who reads it. He'll be energized who reads your book. Every mother here ought to just sit down and talk to your children. Tape it while you're talking. Say 10 things I want my children to remember. And then you've got a book to teach them. You've got a book to teach them. Teach them how to keep a praying order in one room. How could they ever have order in their life if they can't put things where they belong in one room? If you can't make one day go right, how can you make one year go right? So these are things I want to teach you. Let's go a little further with this and then I want to talk to you about your ministry. And ten things I think you need to know to succeed in the ministry. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. We're there to create a change. That's the whole purpose. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Verse 6. You shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. The purpose of the ministry is to bring people into God's presence. To carry the anointing that destroys the yoke. And we call the yoke like a chain. Like a rope. People in bondage. There's people who have a memory bigger than today's bigger than today. Some people can't even unwrap today because their mind is tethered to a memory of someone who hurt them, someone who offended them. It's a major. It's, it's not easy for me to overcome offenses. It's just not. And it's something that I battle when there's been profound disrespect to me, especially if it's someone I love. Someone I care about, somebody I'm fighting for, somebody I've invested in. And suddenly, my voice doesn't matter. My needs do not matter. I have, I have warfare over breaking the chains of an offense. Maybe you someone who can rebuke cancer and the cancer disappear. Someone who can rebuke and drive back the spirit of depression and despondency. And that's what we are in the ministry. I call this a school of ministry. So, because we've got to learn not only to experience God, but to feel what people feel. Now, it took me years to understand that some of my feelings were being picked up from captives. That when you're working around people who are bound, when you're working around people who need to be set free, you will pick up their emotions. You will pick up what they're feeling. You may think it's you, but you're picking up all deliverers absorb the feelings of the captives. How many of you ever watched television and somebody on TV who's praying suddenly said, there's a woman who's got a pain in her lower neck right now. There's a man who's left knee. You've been to the hospital. The doctors say you will never walk again. They begin to pick up the feelings of the captives. I remember while I was preaching one night, I began to feel a horrible cramp in my stomach. And 
and I wasn't sick or sickly, and I was just, oh, I thought I was going to have to close the service. And suddenly I remembered that because I'm called to preach, I have the same feelings as others are feeling. And I said, somebody right now is going through horrible pain in your stomach. Lay your hand on your stomach. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, by whose stripes we're healed, I command your pain to leave right now in Jesus' name. And several were healed all over the building just like that. And of course the pain went away. It wasn't my pain. I was picking up the pain of captives. I was feeling what the people were feeling. And that's real critical in the ministry that you understand. Were they there? Pardon? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But it's important, very important that you understand as you walk on the earth, as you walk into your home, you start feeling things and and sometimes you think, man, I'm going through a, uh, I'm going through such discouragement right now. What is this? I don't know what's wrong. You're picking up on someone who is being assaulted by demonic spirits, and you're feeling what they're feeling. And in that moment, there is a formula that Charles S. Price gave us in his book called The Real Faith. Now, when you are being touched by the how many love that scripture that Jesus is touched with the feelings of our infirmities? Well, that's the Holy Spirit in him. And you have the Holy Spirit in you. And he begins to pick up on the pain of the people. Now some prophetic ministers develop that. And they develop it so much they're able to see things in the Spirit. See things. I have a friend of mine many years ago, Freddie Gray. And he, he went up one night, the place was packed. He went up to a lady and said, you have a gun in your purse right now. You came here to kill somebody. She burst out in tears, opened the purse, and she had a gun and planned to kill her husband. Now, you can develop that awareness and that sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that you begin to see things. You can even see people's names. You can see addresses. And you can develop that type of ministry. You really can. Now, every one of us should be picking up on people's pain, looking into their eyes, just knowing. I, I know many things. Hold on one second. I know many things by the Spirit that people don't know I know. I can be in a service. I can walk. I can be with people and tell you so many things that just amaze you. I prefer not to go that direction, but when I pray for them, that's when I begin to release what I know about them in the Spirit. I've had people burst out crying and say, how could you know? How could you know? Well, we're called. We've been sent by God to set people free. To set them free. Usually there's a theme. I need the, uh, in there, they said I had hundreds of partners, notebooks, and all those things. And, and I, I just knew they would be here. If you could help me, I really appreciate that. But there's importance for you to recognize the difference in you. Now, listen carefully. You can live 20 years and never know the difference in your ministry. I became very close to Will Roberts. In fact, emotionally, I was closer to him than any other human in my lifetime. And we just had a connection that only God, and he called it a David and Jonathan connection. But there's such a closeness. He said we were knit together. Knitted together by the Spirit. But when Brother Will Roberts uh, would spend, we spend hours, I'd, I'd go to home for a Christmas vacation, etc. He says that, he, that every preacher is only given one thing with his life, and at the most, two. Two. He said he had never known any preacher in all of his ministry who had more than two different focuses and themes for their ministry. 
If I say Kenneth Hagen, you're probably going to say Faith, aren't you? If I say Billy Graham, I had Billy Graham a lot on my mind this morning. If I say Billy Graham, you're going to say evangelism. If I say Muhammad Ali, are you going to say golf? You're going to say boxing. If I say Tiger Woods, are you going to say football? No. Are you going to say golf? You need to know how God uses you. How does God use you? And he uses you, you'll know, through three strong emotions. And it's important for you to know the difference. Now, the gospel has two parts. The person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus. I need a stack of books. Uh, you have some? You think it'd bring me a stack of books? Can you bring me a stack of books, then? Hey, will they be here before tomorrow? Yes, they're coming right away. Laugh, everybody. That was funny. <laughs> Hold on one second. Yeah. Isn't that amazing how 1,500 people can watch you around the world for free? Amen. You didn't know about that. Wait till you try a phone. Phones are really wonderful. I'm provoking you here. Okay. <laughs> the gospel has two parts. The person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus. Now, Billy Graham preached on the person of Jesus. Yes, I, I get I went ahead and made it happen. But you can go ahead and bring them up here. Yes, we can put them right here. Thank you, Lynn. I needed a little, uh, I needed a little thing to help me. You can put them right there. Yeah, right there. Thanks. 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 Billy Graham didn't preach much about the principles of Jesus. He preached about the person of Jesus. He preached about mercy, being forgiven, uh, Benny Hinn, and uh, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Hagin preached a lot about the law of faith, the healing. And God called me to preach on the laws of the word. There's 72 I found in the Bible, the law of focus, the law of association, uh, the law of protocol, the protocol of every environment. Because wherever you are has a code of conduct for entering there or staying there. God's called me to talk about two things. The Holy Spirit who is the spirit of wisdom and prosperity. How to prosper. The Bible says that uh, money entereth all things. Money with people or money with God. That everything I need I can get through so you see that by time, my energy, or my etc. Now every man has a different experience with God. I'm going to try to get this. Maybe I can do it over here. It's a pretty sure did it. <laughs> I'm good. I'm learning to take care of myself. <laughs> You must know the theme of your ministry. Also, brother, there's supposed to be school ministry notebooks here too. Just let me know that if you can find them. But it's real critical, very critical, that we know that our difference from someone else. If you can't tell me your difference in one sentence, you don't know your difference. Which means nobody else knows your difference either. 
It's very important to know how does God use you? What's the grace that's upon your life? I marvel at people that pastor because we have a church, the Wisdom Center, family church. And I marvel at men that can preach over and over the same thing and nobody do it. And they have such energy to keep on. I just marvel. How many pastor a church? How many pastor here today? God has to give you a special grace to go back up there to the pulpit. And you've given, how many, ever, how many pastors here have ever given people advice and they didn't follow it? How many want to get out of the spirit for about one hour and take care of them? Oh, that did. <laughs> I marvel because they come to us needing help. You tell them exactly what to do. They walk out of there and don't do a thing you said. Thank you. There's none. Thank you. But it's really important, so important in your life that you find your difference from others. You're different. One of my best friends that I've known my whole life, Jimmy Swagger. Jimmy got real upset at me preaching prosperity. I've spent nights in Jimmy's home. Uh, we, I've known, I preached for his daddy when I was 17 years old. And uh, Jimmy's very, very anti using the word prosperity. I mean, he, he hates it. But his home's worth several million or maybe two million. But he don't like preaching prosperity. For I don't know why. But I said, Jimmy, who's going to help God's family prosper if we don't preach it? I'm going to ask you some questions because the most powerful thing in the universe is a question. Your life succeeds proportionate to your questions. It's your questions that will change the seasons of your ministry. God doesn't decide seasons. Questions decide seasons. question will take you further than four years of college. One question. Until you ask a question, until you ask a question, others control your information. Until you ask a question, a deceiver can hide. Your, your life will improve proportion to the questions you ask. The most important thing I do every day is not read the Bible, though I've read it through over a hundred times, 40 chapters a day. That's not the most important thing I do. The most important thing I do every day is not pray. Though I started praying four hours a day when I was a young preacher. Six to ten every day. Then I went to seven to eleven. Then I end up with nine to one. Most important thing I do every day is ask questions. I ask questions. I ask questions about myself. Ask questions about others. Ask questions about opportunity. What's the best opportunity God's ever given me? What am I doing not doing that God told me to do? Somebody asked me, said, what if you don't know what questions to ask? I said, that's the question you need to say. What question should I be asking? Changes will improve. Your life will improve relative to your questions. How do you respond to an adversary? Because your response to an enemy decides his success against you. How do you handle false accusations? How do you handle disinterest from people that sit under your ministry but they never take notes? They already think they know everything. How many of you ever had somebody that want what you have but didn't want to do what you did? <laughs> Here's some question 
that you should be asking about your calling. What environment brings the best out of me? What environment brings the best out of me? In what environment do I flourish? I only flourish with learners. Just the other day, one of the greatest men I've ever known in my lifetime, Pastor David E. Biobi, Port Harcourt, Nigeria. He's building a church seating 150,000. Every time I go there, I speak six times on Sunday. Begins at 6.30 in the morning. I was there a few weeks ago. And you know how many people watched on the internet, online, to take of it. His church is the most spectacular thing he's building I've ever seen in my lifetime. How he does it, I do not know. But he flew 18 hours to celebrate my birthday. Got there on the closing hour on a Monday night. Flew out the next morning. 18 hours one way. To show me honor. And believe it or not, he's sitting there afterwards writing notes in his journal. Every time I spoke for Boy Roberts, we spent hours together. He'd be sitting there writing, 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 writing. If you're not a learner, today's the best your life will ever be. If you're not a learner, today's the best your life will ever be. I'll say it again. If you're not a learner, today's the best your life will ever be. My how do I know my assignment on the earth? My glasses solve a problem. My handkerchief solves a problem. My pen solves a problem. My telephone solves a problem. Water, drink, solves my eyes, see, my ears, hear, my hands reach, my feet walk. My mouth speaks. Everything on the earth solves problems. Your existence is proof God saw a problem nobody else could solve but you. What is it? Jeremiah 1 says that in your mother's womb, God gave you an assignment. Moses' assignment was to the Israelites. But Aaron's assignment was to Moses. I want to say to every pastor, you'll need somebody to take care of you so you can take care of the family of God. You can't do both, pastors. You can't take care of yourself and all of God's family that he's put under you. Simultaneously, you can't do it. You can try. And but you will know there won't hardly be anybody. You'll have to find them. I think they should find you, but so far they haven't for me. But you'll have to find somebody that makes sure that your food is there when you ask for it. Make sure your clothes are in the cleaner without you asking. Make sure your house is clean. No preacher and no pastor's wife here should ever go to bed without somebody taking care of your kitchen, putting the dishes back in place, having the food there. You cannot take care of your church without somebody taking care of you. You can't take care of your family unless somebody's taking care of you. 
Now let's start. I want to walk, walk through the lot through the ministry here, what the ministry is all about. When Jesus left, he said to he said to Peter. I think this may work. They're sitting beside my face, and I don't like that. Okay. Just bear with me here. When Jesus left, he said, Peter, feed my sheep. If you let me feed my sheep. If you let me take care of my mother, throw John. If you let me take care of my sheep. We're here to manage the growth of God's family. That people become. I, I have a motto at the church, the Wisdom Center, building families that cannot be destroyed. Building families that cannot be destroyed. We have a love for God's family that we don't even understand. We have a love for people that makes us forfeit half of our dreams and goals just to take care. A very, very well-known pastor in America told me some days back, he said, pastoring is a thief. It steals all your joy. It steals all your time with your family. Because he was so discouraged after 30 some 35 years of pastoring. If somebody's not taking care of you, there's no way you can take care of your church. There's no way you can take care of your wife, your children, if somebody's not managing your world, keeping things in place, their attention to you. How do I know what my assignment is on the earth? What do you hate? What makes you angry? A few days ago, I told Benny, I said, Benny, you, because we've known each other 40 years. I said, Benny, I said, we've known each other so long. I said, I said you, you, you have a hatred for the sickness and disease. He said, like nobody would believe. He has a hatred of cancer. A hatred of people being in a wheelchair. A hatred of people being deaf. People who can't see. Why? What you hate is a signal to you. It's a clue. It's a sign of something God wants you to change. You can't conquer what you don't hate. If you don't hate drinking, you'll never be set free from drinking. If you don't hate sickness and disease, you'll never pray for people to be healed. What upsets you? Poverty makes me mad because it's unnecessary. And God's not responsible for your money. Your decisions create your prosperity. God's not accountable for handing you money. God's never written anybody a check. I used to carry 10,000 cash and hold it up. And I say to everybody, I said, if you can show me any check God's ever given you, I'll give you 10,000 cash. Or you can sell it on eBay. Nobody comes up. Why? God doesn't write checks. It's our decisions. I'm going to be sharing that later. The seven decisions that make me a multimillionaire. And it's very important that you understand that. What do you think? I have a hatred for poverty. My dad was poor. When I wanted to build seven churches, I wanted a box of Crayola. 64 was the biggest box. Now they got 96. But when I was growing up, the biggest was, uh, I'm sorry, it was 48. The biggest box was 48. But the biggest box my mother could afford was 24. I begged, I cried for a box of Crayolas, 48. She didn't have the money. When I wanted to go to Bible college, cost $4 a day, Southwestern, 
of Synonyms of God Bible College four hours, four dollars a day, and Daddy didn't have the money for it. Prayed four to ten hours a day. My dad was the prayingest man I ever met, ever knew in my whole lifetime. But nobody taught him. And one day, some years ago, he came up from the front. First time, my daddy never brags on anybody but God. But he came up and he said, Son, if somebody would have taught your mother and me prosperity the way God taught you, our whole ministry would have been different. Isn't that something? If you're not taught it, you don't know it. What's the last five things you've learned in the last five days or what changes have you made in your life because of them? And I'm going to provoke you today to become a learner. To become a learner. What problems do you want to solve that nobody has solved? What problems make you cry? What makes you hurt? It is true that for years and years I have fed over 30,000 children every month and will do that until I go to see Jesus or before Jesus returns. I do spend thousands upon thousands and thousands of dollars buying food for children. Why? I have a hatred And God won't feed him. Why he told you and I to. We're his hands extended. We are the presence of God on the earth. We carry his anointing. We carry his presence. We're here for that reason. What makes you cry? What makes you weep? What do you love to learn about? Every word that Bill Gates, the wealthiest man in America, every word he's ever said, I read. Every word that Warren Buffett, worth 89 billion now, was it 47 billion? statement he never invested in technology. Let me give you a little story here. When Warren Buffett was worth 47 billion dollars, 49 billion, Bill Gates was worth 87 billion. And Warren Buffett was asked, why don't you invest in technology? And he said, it's too volatile. You can't be sure of anything in technology. Oh, I said, well, that's not really true. Look at Bill Gates. So I disagreed with Warren Buffett. So I invested $25,000 in Bill Gates' Microsoft. $25,000. That may be not be a lot of money to you, but a lot of money to me. But the man was worth $87 billion. Man, I'm going to invest in this company. Every 90 days, I'd get a little, little check. $67, $45, $75, every 90 days. I, they, they were so little, I just threw them in a box. I, you know, they ridiculous. And I woke up some months ago and the Holy Spirit said, take your money out of the world system. I won't give you all the details except I had my attorney, Ms. Viviana, to write Microsoft and get all of my $25,000 back that I invested plus whatever they made. Because $25,000, whatever Bill Gates did with my $25,000, uh, whatever he did, I won't do that too. I wanted the money I invested going to be for 15 years. You know how much he sent me back? $19,600. I 
I didn't even get back what I put in. I lost over $5,000 in Microsoft. Now Warren Buffett today is worth in the $87 billion. But I didn't listen to it. Now where'd you going to go maybe to Microsoft and Brother Gates? But I'm sitting with Lord Roberts and my, me and my dad was having lunch one day and he had come through uh, Dallas so we was having lunch together and the Holy Spirit says give him $25,000. I thought give Lord Roberts $25,000? Have you seen City of Faith? He needs to be giving me $25,000. Have you seen Lord Roberts University? He needs to be giving me $25,000. But I had saved up 25000 so that's exactly what I had in my savings account. So 90 minutes later, he's holding my check, and he's closing his eyes and looks at me and says, where do you want the harvest? I gave 25000 to Bill Gates, lost thousands, year after year after year after year. So I put I said, I, I drove one out to check when 90 minutes later, Brother, Brother Orwell was holding it and he said, where do you want to see the harvest? And I told him. In seven to two hours, it's like the heavens open. I'll make it quick because I know my testimony doesn't excite anybody else. It just excites me. You'll hear it, you will. 72 hours later, a man sends me a video singing happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. And I go outside, and he has bought me a brand new $80,000 Corvette, black on black. Yeah. A few months later, a woman comes and gives me her Corvette. It's a very special collection edition. A few months later, a man calls him on the phone. He says, have you seen... He said, you've changed my life so much, I want to bless you. I said, just pray for me. So what, what, are you, what can I do for you? I said, just pray for my wisdom. I'm always doing something stupid. So just pray that God will make me smart. I've just got to get some more wisdom. He said, I mean, what can I Can I buy you a watch? Can I buy you a car? Can I? I said, just pray. I need wisdom. He said, what color of car would you have? I saw the like Michael Black. 14 days later, straight from Germany, came a brand new 745 BMW. Yeah. Then the next one came out, I think it was a 750, and he said that. And then people began to give me cars. And then I, I got a phone call. And the man said, we're around the corner 15 minutes from your house. I drove around. And they were backing up a brand new Mercedes 500 SEL. Wow. For me. And he said, my goal is to give you a brand new car every single year.
Because the Bible says, Thou, 119th Psalm, through thy word hath made me wiser than my enemies. Amen. See, you don't want God to remove an enemy because then you won't get the reward. Amen. You want God to empower you to overcome the enemy. Amen. So we're in the ministry to help people really develop a faith in the Bible, a confidence in the Bible. I had a two-year problem when I had a two-year problem with having faith in the Bible. Very difficult for me. Very hard for me. Because I love my mother and daddy. I believed everything they said until I caught them until I caught them making a mistake. And when my mother and daddy made a mistake, I said, no, maybe they made a mistake about the Bible. Maybe I shouldn't even believe in the Bible. So it took me two years to come to develop a confidence in the Word. There's three major reasons you should believe the Bible. Number one, no human would have written a standard this high. No husband of written in the Bible treats your wife like Christ treats the church. No wife would have written the Bible. Because the Bible says, obey your husband, woman. Now you know your woman would have never written that. So the Bible was not written by man because it's too high of a standard. The proof of God is instant change. The proof of God is not a tree, not a plant or a mountain or an ocean. The proof of God is that men can change instantly. Drug addicts have been set free in a moment. Alcoholics have been set free in a moment. That's the proof of God, is instant change. Men who were hooked on cocaine, Killing people suddenly healed by the power of God set free. Amen. That's why we're in the ministry. We've been set aside. Now people say, well, all of us are ministers. Um, there's a difference in the five-fold ministry. There's a difference between me flying all over the world and preaching the gospel and writing 900 books and being on TV every night. There's a big difference between that and leaning across McDonald's counter telling somebody, Jesus loves you. That's a huge difference, friend. That's huge. <laughs> yeah. Don't you think there's not a difference in the five-fold ministry and just telling somebody, God loves you, home, if you love Jesus? Oh, there's a big difference. And you got to know that difference. What has God called you to do with your life? Who are you learning from? Elisha receives the mantle from Elijah. Not by sitting and listening to him in church, but by serving him. Theologians say that he took care of Elijah for 22 years. And when he went to die, he said, I want the same anointing except I want it double what was on Elijah. The anointing is important. The anointing is important. Let me give you an example. A territorial anointing came upon my life. And God began to give me houses and lands. And, uh, much more than I ever wanted or dreamed of. I mean supernatural. A pastor sat for three days in my uh, birthday celebration. That's what I did for my birthday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I, I fed everybody buffets and I... Uh, I uh, spoke, I taught for six hours a day for my birthday. There's a pastor from Wari, Nigeria, Pastor KK. That's his initials. And everybody calls him Pastor KK. He sat three days in front of me and gave his testimony. As soon as he heard about the territorial anointing that was on my life, he flew all the way from Warren to Lagos to Dallas and came and brought me a seat and said, Daddy, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to put the same territorial anointing on me that's upon you. And in 21 days, I thought it was 14, said the other 21 days, eight pieces of property were given to him first time in the Four of the property.
these were huge. Four were medium size in 21 days. The anointing that you respect is the anointing that comes upon you. The anointing you serve is the anointing that comes upon you. I want to give you 10 things that I think are important to your ministry. One is that you know your difference from every other, every other ministry. You've got to know what makes your ministry unlike everybody else, and you've got to build around your difference. Your difference should be on your pencils. It should be in your website. The name of your church. Everything about you should reflect the difference in your message. You may believe the entire Bible, but you'll never have time to preach it all. <laughs> you can believe the full gospel, but you'll never have enough time to preach it all. If you could preach on one thing, what would it be? If you could write one book, what would it be? Now I'm going to walk you through. Proverbs 4, 7 says wisdom is the principal thing. And all you get is good wisdom. Do I understand? I'll walk you through and then I'll want you to apply it to your ministry because that's why I came here. Because you can change your ministry in a day. In a day. It's according to whose word you believe. I can't change your life till I know the voice you trust. I'm going to give you definitions. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Difference in people. Difference between a Sadducee and a Pharisee. The purpose of wisdom is to identify who you should honor. Honor is the willingness to reward someone for their difference. I had people taking care of my father in his home. And he fell at 4 o'clock in the morning and tore his arm. Bleeding. 99 years old. Had never spent, has never spent one night in a hospital. Well, I immediately said, that changes everything. He's my father. Oh, he's all right. He just fell. No, 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 no. My father doesn't fail. Especially if I'm paying you a fortune not to let him fall. I honor him. He gives anything he wants. Anything. Comes to my house. He likes chocolate milk and ice cream. He gets all he wants. Why? He's my daddy. It's too late to tell him it's not good for his health. Since he's drank chocolate milk and eating ice cream and has good health. <laughs> Maybe that's the key. Maybe I should stop eating potatoes and corn. Go to ice cream. Do you know your difference? Do you think it? Do you know your difference from others? Do you know your difference from others? Can you say it in one sentence? Wisdom is your will to recognize a difference in an environment. Difference in a moment. Unwrapping a moment. That's all. I don't like spending the night in people's houses ever. Not even my kid folks. Brother Morris, your little kid said, please come spend a week with mom and I. Please come spend a week. Long time friend, Dr. Cerullo, his wife, Teresa. Finally, I did some programs there in San Diego and he said, you've got to spend the night. And I remember what honor is. Wisdom is recognizing the difference. Honor is letting someone be blessed through that difference. Showing their honor toward him. He was showing me honor. I decided to spend the night. Why? Honor. Understanding is knowing the value of that difference. Now, I had kid folks that wouldn't drive 10 minutes to my birthday. But the preacher of the largest church in Nigeria flew 18 hours 
to present their birthday gift and then fly all the way back the next day. Mike, why are you saying this? Wisdom is recognition of your own difference, recognition of the difference in others. Honor is rewarding a person for their difference. For their difference. Understanding is knowing the value of that difference. If you don't know the difference in your ministry, you'll never put a great value on it. I know the difference in our ministry. I know what happens when I lay hands on people. I know the radical changes that come in lives. I know. I put so much value on that that I'm very careful about the people that I associate with. You must know the value of your ministry. You must know the value of your words. Some weeks ago, I was in a meeting, and a man who wanted to meet with me, so while we were there, he keeps looking at his phone, and then he takes a little. I stood up and said, Brother, you don't really have time to talk to me. So, oh, no, I just got to say, No, oh, no. God bless you. God bless you. I walked out. If you'd rather text on your telephone, I'm not going to talk to you. Because I know the value of my words. I know the value of my words. Is it in your staff emailing while you're preaching? Is it in your staff emailing their friends while you're preaching the gospel, teaching them? They don't belong there. They don't qualify for access. You must know the value of how God uses you. And you must release anyone that does, doesn't put a value on your difference. A young man came from Africa and he couldn't stay without a lot of money involved. I shelled out, I think one time, $14,000 above his salary just so he could stay in the United States. And every time, every year they stayed, it cost me thousands and thousands of dollars to keep him because he didn't want to go back to Kenya. He wanted to stay in America. And one day I said, I'm just going to pull up and see what his giving is to our ministry. I call it seed status. Now, if you're going to know the difference in your people, you have people in your church that tithe, and you have people that don't tithe. Is there a difference? It's a huge difference. One has a curse, one has a blessing. Yeah, right. God likes one, the other one will go to hell. Yeah, there's a difference. Yeah, right. I listen for difference in every conversation. I listen for difference in every conversation. I listen for the sound of pain because that's what I'm there for to solve a problem. I listen for the sound of honor because if there's no honor, I can't help them. Stay out of the zone of disrespect. You have no business there. Jesus taught the disciples, shake the dust off your feet. You have no business in someone's house that doesn't show you honor and respect. And honor is a gift. It's not an attitude. Respect is an attitude. Honor is substance. Proverbs 3, Malachi 3, Luke 6, 38. I said, pull up his seed steps. His spirit's not right. Something's wrong with his spirit. You know, preachers, we pick up on all that like that. Like that. We know when someone's resentful. We pick up the seething inside. Oh, we pick it up. We know it. They don't even know we know it. You know what is giving for the year was? $20. Two $10 seats. I had shelled out thousands and 
thousands of dollars so he could stay in the United States. You better identify the disrespectful in your ministry. Judas has brothers. Every church has an absent. You don't have to tell everybody. Just silently remove their authority. They have no business accessing you, your voice, the anointing that's upon your life. In fact, if somebody is full of doubt, we all know that scripture where Jesus left Nazareth and went to Capernaum because Heaven and recall the scripture, he could not do many miracles in that place because of the unbelief that was in the people. If doubt and distrust can stop God from being God, if doubt can stop the healing power of Jesus, what makes you think doubters on your staff cannot stop? The flow of God through your living. Deal with it. Deal with it quickly. Deal with it quietly. There's ways to deal with it without a horrible reaction to it. I'm saying this because your ministry is valuable. It's precious to God. It's holy to God. It's too glorious. your ministry needs. First you need you need an experience with God that's removed all your doubts. You must have an encounter with God that nobody, nobody can make you doubt. Nobody can make you doubt. You must have a God encounter. I remember when I fell in love with the Holy Spirit 7 o'clock on a Wednesday morning July the 13th, 1994. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1956. 1956. 38 years later, 38, whatever 94 is for, years later, I fell in love with him as a person on my right side who advised me. I found out that if I wanted divine options to a problem I was facing that I could tie my mind, tether my, my mind to one subject and pray in tongues. And God would give me a list of options of what to do in every problem. Your prayer language is the crux of the gospel. It's not a PS. The prayer language is the essence of Christianity. It's the essence. It's the core. It's the core. If you're going through a problem with one of your children, put your hand on the face of your children. Pray in the Holy Ghost and watch God. Now usually he answers me within 15 minutes. The longest I've ever had to wait was 90 minutes. If you have a problem in your ministry and you lay your hand on someone's picture, wherever the problem is, and pray in your prayer language, God will give you a list of options. It's profound. It's profound. Amen. And it works. Oh, yeah. Glory to God. Oh, yeah. it works. Oh, Number two, you need to know your difference. You need to know what you have that nobody else has. I was going to preach at Notre Dame one day, or uh, every year, Lester Sumball had a big uh, thing in the stadium there in uh, South Bend, Indiana. And it was an annual event, all of his partners, etc. Me, Rod Parsley, and Off Edmund, young man from Sweden. I don't know if you ever heard of Off Edmund. But we were all there. Well, Brother Sumrock comes in, he says, Mike, you want to preach first or second tonight? There was two of us every night. And I said, Oh, Dr. Sumrock, it doesn't make me any difference. Whatever. It doesn't make me any difference. Whatever. Whatever. And uh, he said, well, he said, uh, off is going to preach. And if you want to be 
for us and you for me. I said, Dr. Shamal, nobody preaches what I preach. So I don't care when you put me up there. Nobody's going to say what I say anyway. <laughs> put me first, put me second. Nobody knows what I know. That's part of the difference. Do you know your difference from everybody else? What has God put inside of you that nobody else has? Have you found the genius of God in your own ministry? Have you found your difference? Have you built your life around it? Have you become consumed because you can only succeed with an obsession? Your assignment's always to a person or a group of people. If your name is Aaron, your assignment's to Moses. If your name is Moses, your assignment to the Israelites. How do you know to whom you have been assigned? Whose enemies are you willing to take on? Whose tears affect you? Now let me tell you a philosophy 
that many people believe in Christianity that I, I challenge. One of the great preachers, we all know him, wonderful man of God, 16,000 people that night, and he gets through preaching. And, uh, and he preaches, God's in control. God's in control. So after the service, I met him back in the back green room, and I said, uh, everybody shouted tonight when you said God's in control. I want you to write down a list of what God controls. Write it out for me. Just write a list. I want you to show me. Write out everything God controls. He said everything. God's in control. God's predestined everything. I said, you, you should. I said, so if your little daughter gets raped to her teenage daughter, I said, would you tell the policeman that night? Hey, 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 don't worry about the guy. God had a reason for him. Is that how you just comfort your little girl? You just hug her and say, baby, God has a reason for everything. God, God has it. Have you ever heard that there's a reason for everything? Yes. <laughs> he just stared at me. I said, if, you, if your wife gets killed by a drunk driver, is that what you tell everybody at her funeral? Hey, God.